Nancy, take a seat. Well, today's reading, we're continuing, in fact, finishing reading the book of Jonah. And we're going to read Jonah chapter 4, which can be found on page 928 of the Church Bibles if you wanted to follow. And the chapter's titled, Jonah's Anger at the Lord's Compassion. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But jo God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You've been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Indeed, as we come to God's word, let's pray um, once more. Let's pray together. Just as we sung, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever, and we pray this morning that we would treat it so. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, indeed, we come to the final. We've been, if you're just joining us um, this morning, you're very welcome. We have been looking at um, the, this book, this little book in the Old Testament of Jonah, traveling through um, his journeys really with him over the last few weeks, and we come to the final chapter uh, this morning. If you're here for the fir first time and you haven't been following through Jonah, that's okay. This passage stands alone and has much to teach us, really, as we, as we go through and really conclude um, what's going on and who God is, who we are um, as his people, perhaps as those investigating about who this God is and wondering, could this be uh, a God that we want to follow? The God that, of the universe of, that's made all things that uh, we want to bow down before as Lord. So it's relevant for each and every one um, of us today. Now let me, as we start, uh, start with a story. Uh, I want to tell you about a, a family who lived not too far away from here. Uh, they're called the Reynolds uh, Joe and Sophie uh, were, were the, the, the parents uh, there. The Reynolds were a, a Christian family. They had uh, normal family tiffs from time to time, stresses at, at work. They weren't perfect, but their faith was very real. And they were a very valued family in their, both their church and indeed uh, in their, their community. Now, the Reynolds, well, they lived next door to um, the Dunnets this family, the Dunnets. Now, the Dunnets were a completely different story. They were lazy, they're loud, chaotic, obnoxious. They care for no one else but for themselves. Now, the Reynolds, when they moved in, they initially tried to offer friendship and hospitality. They tried to, as many do, try to be good neighbors, tried to, to get to know the neighbors. They invited them around for, for barbecues and lunches, etc. but it was all thrown back in their face. And they even give over a large slice of their garden. Uh, at, at one stage, the, the, the Reynolds had said that the plans had all been uh, drawn up uh, in, in the incorrect way. And instead of um, arguing it, the Reynolds had said, well, we've got plenty of, 
of garden. And let's, for the sake of living at peace um, with this family, we'll give it over to them. And so they, they, they give over and, and redrew uh, the lines. So this went on in terms of um, trying to offer hospitality and friendship for uh, a, a while. But then things started to get out of hand. You see, uh, the Dunnets got more cruel. Uh, they treated the Reynolds uh, worse and worse. The trouble escalated, late night parties. The Dunnets started to park in the Reynolds reserved parking space and they refused to move when challenged. The Reynolds tried their best to be charitable and patient, but things came to a head when the Dunnets' kids and their friends started to bully the Reynolds' oldest 13-year-old, Ryan. Now, day after day, Ryan would come home depressed, fearful, sometimes bruised. And so Joe, the dad, decided enough was enough. And one day he went round and he confronted uh, the Dunnets. He expected a row, but he couldn't imagine what would happen next. That night, Joe was met by three hooded men who knocked on his door, dragged him outside. They broke his arm. They smashed four of his teeth. And when Joe stumbled back into the house, well, he found the family dog dead had been hit by a brick. Now, in the following weeks, the police investigated, but they couldn't gather enough evidence or any witnesses uh, to make an arrest. Now, the traumatized Reynolds at this is they moved a mile down uh, the road. They were wrecked. And they moved into this new house, and, al and, and although they'd never be the same again over those years um, next to this family, they tried to move on. And any time they thought about the Dunnets, well, they were able to deal with it in this way. They knew God is just. And so what did that mean? Well, they, that meant that he knew that whatever wrongs that they suffered now would be made right. Justice would come. One day, everyone will meet God face to face, and judgment will be on those who indeed have done wrong, who have not trusted him, who have not loved him. It still wasn't easy for them, but that's what truth they held on to as they tried to rebuild their lives. Now, that's not the end of the story. Then one Sunday, months later, one Sunday, as Joe stood up to sing in church, as we've done this morning, he saw across the hall, who did he see? But the Dunnets. He saw the Dunnett family, and he couldn't help but for his heart to sink as he saw them. As it turned out, the Dunnets had heard the gospel. They had become Christians in those months. They were invited into a, a home group. They were very much warmly welcomed into to church life. They were generally loved by many, including some of the Reynolds' closest friends. Now, as Joe looked across the room and he saw the Dunnets, as he saw his friends welcoming them, well, how did he feel? How would you feel if that was you? You see, the one thing that had kept the Reynolds seeing was that, that this horrible, wretched family that had caused them so much pain, well, they were going to be judged. But now, if Joe understood the gospel properly, and he did understand the gospel properly, well, the Dunnets would never face that judgment. In fact, it's the very opposite. The very opposite is true. They had only life and love and great reward to look forward to because Christ had righted all the wrongs. That's the gospel. Well, there's a problem there, isn't there? There's a problem in our hearts. There's a problem in Joe's heart. There's a problem with the situation. And this is the problem we meet in Jonah this morning. See, Nineveh, it was a great city, as we've been looking at over the, the last few weeks. It's a, a key city in this massive empire of Assyria, who's really taking over uh, the world. And where is your heart when someone hurts you? Do you want to see them crushed? Or do you want to see them forgiven? Many of us will know the right answer to that, but do we really believe that? Do we feel it? Well, Jonah 4 offers us two alternative views of justice. One where people get what they deserve. 
and the other where God shows mercy. And that's what we look at in two points this morning. First of all, first point, Jonah wants to limit God's mercy to the world. He wants to limit it. He wants to control it. He wants to limit God's mercy to the world. So the story so far, we came to the end of chapter three last week. Jonah had warned of God's judgment and the Ninevites had responded really in the best way possible, the only way possible for their survival. Nineveh's evil had risen up against the Lord. He was ready to judge them for it. And they responded by repenting of their evil ways. They were sorry. They understood for the first time who God was. They understood what he meant, his holiness, how good he is. They understood his feelings. They understood what it meant to follow him, to live in a very different way. And they repented. And they came to him. And God saw the response and marvelously and mercifully, the chapter ends with this line, God relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And now we're in chapter four. We're back to Jonah and God again. And Jonah does not like it. Verse one, have a look, what does it say? But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. See, God had shown mercy and Jonah objects. And not only did he not like it, but he questions here God's morality. He accuses God of being wrong. Did you note that? How strong it is? He thought of God's behavior as wrong. You are wrong, God. You don't know the right answer in this case, in this situation. See, Jonah, the prophet, whose role, indeed, Jonah's job was to bring God's word, and he doesn't like it. He doesn't like God's word. In fact, he thinks God's word was very wrong for the world. He wants to silence God. We're better off without it, God. Don't give us it. And there are many today who claim just that. They shout that God's word is outdated, it's irrelevant, and even worse, they say it's immoral. You see, the fruit of rebellion against God is to paint him as the immoral one, not us, but God as the immoral one, to spread the lie that his ways are not good for us. Humanity knows what is best for humanity, not God. Humanity knows thrones were made for people, not for God. For it is humanity who is just and fair and right and good, not God. You see, God acts and Jonah is angry at him. And through the lens of chapter 4, we are taken through the error of Jonah's rebellion. Why is Jonah unfairly angry? Well, that's what we're going to drill into now for the next few moments. There's two reasons that we're flagging up this morning on why Jonah is angry. Firstly... Jonah refuses to trust God. It's very simple. He refuses to trust God. You see, he gives us a good picture, really, of the human condition. Even after all that Jonah had been through, even after repenting when he spat out of the fish and he had repented, finally he got to obeying God's word, obeying the Lord by preaching in Nineveh. He'd been through all this. He'd been quite a journey. We've been with him over the last few weeks. And despite all of this happen, happening, well, Jonah's heart is still not right. And we finally get to see what it is, verses two and three. Isn't this what I said, Lord? I knew that you are gracious. I knew that you are compassionate. I knew what you were like. This is why I wanted to go home. I wanted to get as far away from these Ninevites as possible. You see, Jonah's hatred for these people, it ran so deep that he didn't want God to save him. So the Assyrians, as we've said, were evil. There is no question that they deserve judgment. Remember in in verse 1, their wickedness had, of of chapter 1, their wickedness had come up before God. Their wickedness was serious enough that God would would come and, and act on it at that moment. It had come up before God. God had seen it. God had heard the pain they caused. There's no question that they were in the wrong. Children would have woken at night terrified 
of Assyria turning their evil gaze towards their town. Families and communities were eradicated at a whim. Women raped, men cut apart, children burned. It was a true reign of terror. They lived for themselves. They lived for their own glory. They worshipped idols and they lived out whatever desires pleased them at great cost to anyone else. Assyria was very clearly Israel's enemy. It stood for something very different to what Israel stood for. And Jonah's enemy, because it was Israel's enemy, and it was God's enemy. And Jonah was unwilling to trust God's will for his world. He decided it should play out very differently. He refused to entertain the idea that God's will to save these people was a good thing. Jonah wanted to be the one to decide who would be saved, not God. And you can see that really from these verses as, as we've read through them. You can see it in verses two and three. It resembles very much a toddler tantrum. And there's quite a few toddlers here and uh, our parents that would recognize a toddler tantrum. I think that's what's going on here. I've slightly paraphrased it. I knew it, God. I knew what you're like. You're doing my head in. That's exactly why I wanted to get as far away from this place as possible. You and your compassion and your love. I knew you weren't going to do it. I knew what you weren't going to do what you were meant to do and obliterate them. Kill me now, he says, for I cannot watch you rule over this world. You see, Jonah's anger and his bitterness had taken control of his senses. He wants a very different God, one who will act on how Jonah feels at that moment. He wants God in his pocket. He wants God to act how Jonah expects him to act. Jonah wants to decide who is worth saving. And here's the question for us. Can you see any of Jonah's behavior in yourself? My will first. God's way, yes. But only if it fits mine. You see, like Jonah, we may even think we're doing the right thing, often. Living how we think a Christian should live. But we sometimes are just, if we peel off that veneer, and many are still angry at God. Angry that he expects us to serve. Angry that others have more. Angry about what we've given up, perhaps, for him. We don't think we've been paid enough in return for what we've given for him. It's well documented, isn't it, that the church in England has has seen much decline over the last hundred years. Well, I think it should probably be just as documented that the ones that are left behind are often the miserable ones that are left in the churches. Anger hasn't left out the door. Still many angry people. And anger is a very revealing emotion. It often says what we feel about God and indeed God's world. It says God isn't playing our way. And indeed, that was certainly the case for, for Jonah here. So Jonah, he fails to trust God. And secondly, Jonah forgets God's mercy in his own life. He fails to trust him, and he's completely forgotten what God has done for him. You see, he has a very short memory, doesn't he? At any stage, God could have flicked Jonah out of the picture in these earlier chapters the storm could have finished him off he could have died at the bottom of of the ocean he could have perished miserably inside the the salty entrails of a of a large fish but all the way through we see god cares not just for nineveh but he also cares for jonah and he doesn't let him just run away into the sunset and live how he wants to live he cares too much for him he loves him. He doesn't let him die. He restores him. He brings him to repentance in the fish, and he recommissions him again to do what he was born to do, to preach. You see, Jonah had renounced God plenty of times in these chapters, but God never once renounces Jonah. But somewhere across the desert journey to Nineveh. So he's been spat out on the beach. He's made his way over to Nineveh. And Jonah's memories fade very quickly. 
He forgets God's mercy on him. He is the epitome here of entitlement. God has specially chosen me. And boy, has he made a good choice. Entitlement, pride, self-indulgence in his toddler strop, we see it all. Jonah stops being thankful for all that he's been given. He's forgotten. He's forgotten all the good things he's been given. And that's easily done, isn't it? A Christian grows angry when she forgets what God has done for her, and sometimes very quickly. A Christian feels entitled when he forgets that Christ's death was necessary to clean up the mess that he made. We deserve only death, each and every one of us. I had a friend who was so excited to first hear about the gospel, and he was so excited by this idea of of Christian community and and this good news that God had come to, to save him. I remember the excitement in his voice as he spoke about being baptized, and he did go on and, and, and get and baptized. I remember, remember the evening, yet only a few months after baptism, he struggled. He struggled with God not giving to him what he expected God to give him. And very quickly, things started to unravel. He started to speak again with anger, and then he walked away from God. The God who he felt had given him so much only a few months before he'd probably declared it in quite a large church. He'd probably publicly declared God's love for him. And then only weeks, months later, he walked away. He had forgotten. We have very short memories. Our affections, they're transient. One day we speak with enthusiasm about how much God has done. Then the next day we wonder if he cares at all. And we quickly forget our own plight and the lengths God has gone to on our behalf. But the very, very good news in this passage is that God is not like Jonah. The very good news of this passage is that God is not like us. See, chapter 4 shows an alternative perspective. God speaks in these next few verses, and he shows a very different attitude to Jonas. Not a complacent one. He cannot and will not be apathetic to evil, but he is merciful. And so let's look um, at the second main point. God rules the world with relentless love. Verse 4 gives us the response of an extraordinarily patient and compassionate parent. If any of you uh, parents have had a a toddler strop in the middle of a shopping aisle, well, you'll understand um, what's going on here, and you'll understand the patience it takes. But the Lord replied, "Is is it right for you to be angry? Is it right for you to be angry, Jonah? And through the giving and the taking away of this, this large leafy plant we've got in these verses, well, the Lord teaches Jonah about his vantage point. He's sitting in a very different place, in a very different seat from Jonah. We've got this summary in verses 5 to 8. So Jonah, well, again, another paraphrase, he brings out his deck chair, his popcorn, perhaps. He's hoping here that God would see sense. Perhaps Jonah's calm and articulate and well-reasoned prayer in verses 1 to 3, well, has hit just the right spot with God. And he convinces God that he, God needs to change his mind. Oh, yes, Jonah, you've just corrected me. I made a mistake. Uh, I, I'm sorry about that. And he decides then to, 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 to destroy, to obliterate the Ninevites, as he should, as Jonah thinks. So Jonah, well, he goes east of the city. He, he builds himself um, a shelter. And he eagerly waits to see what God will do. He's really expecting, I think, at this moment, for God again to destroy. He's sitting waiting. But just like, like me yesterday... I went to an outdoor swimming pool yesterday as I saw the weather forecast, uh, and I expected something very differently um, from from what I got. Well, things don't pan out for Jonah uh, as he wishes. God turns up in verse 7 to teach Jonah, and the lesson comes through a spot of botany. Jonah is initially delighted by the plant that God has provided. The Lord had obviously got his act together. Not only would he now give the Ninevites what he deserved, 
but he would also provide Jonah with the comfort he needed to maximize his joy in watching. That's the sort of thing that was going on in Jonah's head. Then in verse 7, we see again, it's not the pagan sailors here from chapter 1. It's not the Ninevites from chapter 3. It's not them that need extra tuition. It's only Jonah. See, God sends his hungry worm, a scorching wind, a hot sun. Again, he's showing he's the boss over all things. He can use creation. He can wield it in whatever way he wants. Nothing by accident. And again, Jonah reverts to type. He calls for death. How many times has Jonah done that? This passage, kill me! Kill me, but he's still there. Still complaining. And through this very simple illustration, God provides some very, very precious words. Words that would change hearts, minds, ambitions. The level of gratitude it would bring to all who read them and understand what they mean. Verse 11, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left? See, little Jonah, he has so much to learn about the world and the one who made it. Jonah cared for a plant. God cared for a city. Jonah cared for vengeance. God cared for mercy. Should I not have concern for this great city of Nineveh, all of these people who I've knitted together in their mother's wombs, who I know intimately, think of the care God has taken in designing each and every one of us. And this is my Father's Day message to all those dads out there. Don't let your kids tell you any differently. You are quite the specimen. Think of our eyes. I was just reading with the kids this week. At five months of development, God connected one million optic nerve endings from our eyes, and he connected them with another million optic nerve endings from our brain. He got every single one of those million just right so that I can see you all very clearly now today. One million, five months old. He knows each and every one of our five million hair follicles on our bodies. Again, dads, don't let your kids tell you that you've lost all your hair. You've got five million of those beauties. Do we understand what God is saying here? Do you understand, Jonah, how invested I am in these people? You are not God. You are not invested in these people as I am. You have no idea how much I care. And as you think about yourself and expect everything to revolve around your own little world... Well, my name is far greater. My compassion goes way deeper. My love's so infectious that you cannot hold it back. Jonah, you cannot hold me back. I will move winds. Literally, I will move wind and sea for these people. I want them to know me. I have decided you cannot silence me. I will show mercy. They are lost in their sin. They cannot tell their right hand from their left. They need to know that judgment is coming. And they need to know that they need to turn from their evil ways. And I will relent. You see, God cares for this world. And he cares for people to know him and repent. So Rob and Jane at number 58, or Jasmine who sits lonely in her her council office at a desk every day, or Phil, who you perhaps see walking the dog each day in the park. Amidst all their needs, in their pride and anger and anxieties, their primary need is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Their greatest need is for God to bring them salvation. And Christ has already purchased that way. We simply share it. That's what Jonah's job was. It wasn't to to do anything other than sharing the good news that, of God's salvation to these people. And so like Jonah, we cannot be silent. 
Jonah's errors must be learned as we read through this, and the church must proclaim the good news of Jesus. And if we take a moment and go back to the story at the start, just again to really focus in on this idea of justice for a moment, is it wrong for Joe, for Joe Reynolds, to want judgment for the wrongs he suffered? Well, no, it's absolutely not. God rules in perfect justice, and all wrongs will be will be righted one day, they will be corrected. But when Joe sees his own neighbors in that church on a Sunday, repentant and worshiping Christ, well, he must allow it to lead him to what has happened on the cross, on Christ's cross. Every evil Joe has suffered has been dealt with in the most severe way possible. Just like he's forgiven this, this neighboring family that caused him so much pain. He has forgiven Joe. The eternal, the eternal son has bore that cost. It's paid for. And Joe needs to rejoice in that. And when he sees others who have perhaps even wronged him come to Christ, well, he must be brought to rejoice in the Savior who has died for him, for the church. So what does that mean for Joe? Well, every wrong that he has done has been righted. Every cruel word he's spoken to his wife Every time he's lost his temper with the kids and contributed to their own insecurities growing up. Every time he's treated junior colleagues at work as if they were a piece of mud on his shoe. Well, Christ has paid all of that as well. The story is told of a young boy who went to school embarrassed by the, the horrible sc scars on his, um, I don't know if you know the story, but uh, the horrible scar scars on his older brother's hand. So he goes into school and um, he finds that other kids are starting to tease his, his older brother. And as they see him tease these, these, these horrible scars um, on, on the brother's hands, well, um, the younger brother then takes a, a step sideways. He starts to, to get quite embarrassed, but he starts to detach himself um, from his brother and say, actually, I'd, I'd like to go to school um, myself on, on my own. I'm not going to be anywhere near you as, as people give you a hard time. One day, his mom saw this, uh, and he, she then explained how his brother got the scars. The brother got the scars because when um, this younger brother was a, a toddler, he had grabbed up um, boiling water ready to, to, to pull it down off, off the hob and it was ready to go over. And his older brother saw it, he ran in, he grabbed the saucepan with bare hands, the hot saucepan, and he, he ran out of the way with it and threw it in the sink. And it caused his hands to completely tear apart. In the burn. And so months of, of um, recuperation and going into hospital, it couldn't be repaired. His hands were a mess. Now, as the mom told the younger brother that story, how was the younger brother to see his brother now? Very differently. He suddenly became very thankful and very proud for the greatest big brother you could ever have. And if you're a Christian here this morning, well, your older brother has scarred hands for you because nails were hammered in through them. He saw the trouble you were in and he chose to die. Our wickedness has risen up before the Lord. Our wickedness has risen up before the Lord and Christ has paid the cost. That's why we want to plant a church to make Jesus Christ, this Jesus Christ, known. That's why we want anyone and everyone here in Luz to come to know Christ. That's why we will want to invite them next week to our, serve, to our guest service. That's why we will want to witness and live out the faith in front of them. Because, as Jonah says, salvation comes from the Lord. And so Jonah's lesson is the very same message to every reader here this morning. I don't know if you noticed, uh, we don't know how Jonah responds. That's deliberate. Here we're meant to step into Jonah's shoes and respond faithfully ourselves. It's meant to be for the reader that we don't know how Jonah responds. We're meant to here identify with Jonah. What do we do? God has come and spoken. Mercy is his. Do we accept it? And whether it's because we're angry and the idea of eternal comeuppance is how we cope, perhaps we're distracted simply by busyness or leisure, or we're just too self-involved. And God says, should I not pity 
the great town of Maidstone. Did you notice the numbers? I, I saw a few of you noted, um, noting it. A great town of Maidstone in which there are more than 120,000 people. Should I not have pity on the residents of Lewes who cannot tell their right from their left? Let's pray. And we pray, salvation comes from the Lord. We come before you, Father, humble, deserving of nothing, yet in praise that we are given everything through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray, please, I pray for each and every one of us who uh, are dealing with issues of justice, personal angst, suffering perhaps from others, Again, comfort us to know that you are the God of justice where all rights will be wronged. But please, Father, I pray, you would give us forgiving hearts that we would rejoice in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. And so instead of anger, we would live in grace, in peace, in love, in kindness. And so we pray today, bless us in faith, Bless us in knowledge of how merciful you are. I pray for those that, and perhaps here even this morning, that are still working out who you are. We pray, speak to us today. Show us your mercy. 